On Wednesday morning, some pollster is going to have to make an explanation as to why they were so wrong. Marco Rubio insists he can win Florida, and he blames Donald Trump for the violence at his rallies. We go one on one with Rubio this morning. That campaign trail violence raises new concerns and new questions about the race and the Republican Party. We will take it to the roundtable. It is over in Tallahassee. The annual legislative session ends on a high note and high fives. Two leading lawmakers are here with us to explain what it means to you. Good morning and welcome. A big week ahead with Florida's primary just two days away and a big week behind us with presidential debates and the end of the state legislative session. We will hear from two state lawmakers coming up, but first let's hear from Marco Rubio. The Republican senator from Miami knows that he has to win Florida Tuesday or his campaign for president effectively is over. At least that's what the conventional wisdom says. I spoke with Rubio a short time ago. And joining us now by satellite is Senator Marco Rubio. Senator, good morning. Good to see you. Good morning, Michael. Good, good to see you. Uh, Senator, for the last number of days, you have been campaigning nonstop around the state. You've had enthusiastic audiences, I know. Uh, but here's the question. The polls say that you cannot win Florida, that you are far behind. What's your feeling? Can you catch up? Can you win? Well, we will. I'm confident of that. And I already told another journalist earlier today, on Wednesday morning, some pollster is going to have to make an explanation as to why they were so wrong, because they're all over the place, these polls. You have some polls showing me down 20 points, which is absurd, and you have other points showing it in single digits. So we've always said we're an underdog. We're in a very unusual year. We're running into this electoral phenomenon that is the Donald Trump campaign. But he simply cannot be the nominee of the Republican Party. And I hope people over the last 72 hours have watched what awaits us this summer and fall if he's our nominee? This is a man who says obscene and aggressive and outrageous and vulgar things on a regular basis, and it is ripping our nation and our party apart at the seams. We cannot continue in this direction. We can't solve problems in this country if we can't have a decent political discourse. We can disagree on issues. We can do so passionately. But this has now reached a point of violence and anger yeah. that we haven't seen in American politics since the 1960s. Well, I was going to say, not since I remember George C. Wallace, have I seen these kinds of demonstrations and violence. But here's the point I want to ask you. Donald Trump says, I am not responsible for the violence that's out breaking out at my rallies. Is he responsible? There are consequences to the words of a leader, even a presidential candidate. And when you go around at an event telling people, oh, so let's beat up the protester, I'll pay your legal fees, when your campaign manager is now being under investigation for assaulting a female reporter at an event here in Florida, uh, when you have people sucker punching some guy, a, a protester at an event, and then when they're released from prison, they say, or released from jail, they say, next time we're going to kill him, and you don't condemn it, you are responsible. The fact of the matter is that whether he thinks these things are a joke or not, not everyone out there has balance. Some people hear this stuff and it incites them to go further than they should. And I think he is responsible for it. Look, yesterday he gave a rally and he once again repeats this crazy story about how some American general 50 or 60 years ago yeah. dipped bullets in pig's blood and shot John, a bunch of John prisoners. Pershing, and, yeah, general John well, that's Pershing. just not true. But yeah. when someone hears that kind of stuff and starts to cheer, that, first of all, that would have been a war crime. And second of all, uh, it's just not something that we as a nation would ever do. What kind of leader goes around kind of spreading a lie like that as if it's a glorious thing that perhaps we should be thinking about doing? Well, I mean, there uh, are consequences to this, yeah. and we're seeing it play out before our eyes. Yeah. Well, Senator, on, on a Wednesday night at the debate here at Miami-Dade College, uh, Jake Tapper asked uh, Donald Trump about this, and he went into kind of an elaborate uh, explanation, but he essentially said, I don't condone this and I don't want my supporters to do this, but it seemed frankly kind of tepid. I mean, he, he did not say this is wrong, you must stop. Are you still waiting for him to unequivocally say that? Yeah, except he's not going to do it. He's shown an unwillingness to do these things because he doesn't want to turn away any supporters. Look, he, has, he made a decision when he got into this campaign that there were angry and frustrated people in America. And instead of saying, I know you're angry and frustrated, here's how we're going to fix it so you can have some hope, he's decided to make them angrier and more frustrated and to say to them, the reason why things are going wrong for you is because 
this group of people, it's Japan, it's China, it's Mexico, yeah. it's Muslims, it's you fill in the blank, yeah. it's their fault. And so let's get really angry, give me the power and we'll go after them. This is dangerous rhetoric and it is leading us in a direction that we are not going to like. And I think people need to wake up before it's too late here and put a stop to this. Yeah. Or we are all, and I mean all of us, are going to pay a terrible price for what's happening in this campaign. Uh, Senator Rubio, I think that this whole idea of the coarsening of the political discourse, uh, it didn't begin with Donald Trump. And I see that yesterday you told uh, a Washington Post reporter that President Obama bears some responsibility for it. How? What has President Obama said that is nearly as radical, as, as inflammatory as Donald Trump? Well, I've never said that it's nearly as radical in terms of violence or anything of that nature. But I have seen this president in the past basically imply that if you don't agree with him on Medicare and Medicaid, that you don't care about the disabled or the elderly. I've seen him flat out say that if you're pro-life like I am, you're waging a war on women. I've seen him flat out say that, you know, if you don't agree with health care, health care plan, you don't care about sick Americans. Yeah, but I've seen him flat out say that if you support the yeah. Second Amendment. Yeah, but, no, but hold on, let me say finish, Michael. I, okay, I, I've right. heard him say that if you don't support that, if you're a supporter of the Second Amendment and don't support his gun laws, that you didn't care about what's hap what happened in Sandy Hook or gun violence. So he most certainly has chosen to be divisive. I'm not comparing that to what we're seeing now in these events. I mean, this is a new development in American politics that we haven't seen since the 60s, which I believe is dangerous, and it happens to be happening in my own party, and I'm deeply concerned about that. Uh, Senator, on Friday, I spent the day covering a visit to Miami by Ben Rhodes, the Deputy National Security Advisor, who is really the architect of this initiative, this opening of relations uh, with, uh, between the U.S. and Cuba. And Ben Rhodes said, over and over again, the president is going to meet with dissidents, with pro-democracy activists of his choosing. There will be 10 to 15 of them. He is going to meet with them and give them his support and hear their concerns. Now, that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? Sure. The problem is, first of all, well, let's see who the list is. Second of all, a meeting is good. It's important. But a meeting is not going to cover up for the fact that the images that are going to be around the world are the images of the U.S. president socializing with and having a good old time with a dictator. And the message that that sends to the world is this whole thing about changing government in Cuba, having them open up more, that's not a priority anymore. We're, we're really not focused on that. We have now accepted this as the legitimate leaders of this country and uh, everybody else should. And sure, we'll give lip service to democracy. We'll meet with dissidents. But a meeting with dissidents and a meeting with democracy uh, actors on the island is not going to be able to make up for the fact that the president and the images the world is going to see is that of the American president with his arm around and basically socializing with and sending a powerful image that we now accept the Castro government as a legitimate form of government on the island. I think that's going to be a devastating imagery that uh, is going to have long-term consequences for the democracy movement on the island. All right, and let me just sort of go back to the uh, point where we began, and that is Florida. You are feeling confident that you are going to win on Tuesday, just as, in a sense, as Bernie Sanders upset all the pollsters and the conventional wisdom in Michigan. He won there. You think you're going to pull it off here? I do. Of course, if people come out and vote. I mean, the people watching this on a Sunday afternoon have to go to, you can vote early today, and you should, because Tuesday is going to be a madhouse. But if Tuesday comes, don't forget to go vote. I hope everyone comes out and vote. I need their support. I need their help. I can win Florida. I will win Florida if the people watching this go out and vote for me. And, and if I would you just don't say, win, you know, can you go forward? Can you go forward sure. if you don't win on Tuesday? Yeah, this is not a, yeah, because this is not a traditional year. People haven't realized this, but Donald Trump will have to win 62% of the delegates remaining in order to be the nominee. I don't know how he does that. And, and, and Ted Cruz would have to win 75% of the delegates that are left to be the nominee. There's no way he does that. So I, we are on charter territory here, but this is a very unique election. Listen, if anybody else was the front runner, if it was Jeb Bush the front runner instead of Donald Trump, this race would be over. Everyone would be rallying around him, but it's Donald Trump, and he's unacceptable to two-thirds of the Republican Party. So all I can tell you is, well after Florida, this will still be going on. Florida will be very important. If I win, it'll be an enormous boost to our campaign. We won in Washington yesterday. Uh, we feel good about that. We're going to keep chipping away here. I will never give up on this because what's at stake is too important. Senator Rubio, thanks for your time this morning, and we will see you Tuesday night in your hometown. Thanks yes, very sir. much. Yes, sir. Thank you, Michael. <laughs>
And up next, two South Florida lawmakers are in the house to tell us what they accomplished in Tallahassee over the last two months and what that means to you. Stay tuned. The state budget is passed. Those hankies dropped in the state capitol after two months of bill crafting and horse trading. But it is Governor Rick Scott who may need a hanky after being dissed by the lawmakers of both parties. He didn't get what he wanted. With little dissent, legislators passed an $82 billion budget, money for many worthwhile things and also some turkeys. Jose Javier Rodriguez is the representative. Oh, okay, and we will introduce him in just a minute. But first, at the center of it all, Senator Miguel Diaz de la Portilla, a Republican from Southwest Miami-Dade who chairs the Senate Judiciary Committee. His actions effectively killed the proposed open carry and campus gun bills this section. And Representative Jose Javier Rodriguez, Democrat from Miami, one of the more vocal opponents of the governor's proposed billion dollar tax cut that eventually was cut just about in half. And welcome, Thank you. both of you. Thanks Great so much. Great to have you both come in. You've just come home from Tallahassee. Representative, yes. let me begin with you. You are part of the minority party <clears throat> up there, but all but one Democrat voted for the budget that uh, Senator Miguel Diaz de Portilla and the Republicans proposed. This was just, you know, a kumbaya moment up in Tallahassee after last year where you guys couldn't agree on anything. What happened? What was different? Uh, there, there are two things, I think, that really brought uh, the legislature across party lines, across the Senate and the House. Uh, one is the governor has been so extreme in terms of his governing style that has really forced uh, the two chambers to work more closely together. And in terms of partisanship, I think, you know, the fair district's rulings have redrawn the Senate map. And I mm -hmm. think a lot of the dynamics we're seeing in terms of crossing the aisle um, really are, are related to that. And I think in terms of why I voted for the budget really are two things. Um, as the vice chair of the day delegation, along with Jose Felix Diaz, our chair, uh, it was a great year for the day delegation. It, it, you got uh, along well. There was collegiality. But we also got a lot of things done in policy and in the budget. The more important reason, I think, that, that I, th I thought this was a great year for the budget and something I think we should build on, $286 million went to paying down, uh, went to our local schools to pay down what would otherwise be more local property taxes in our school system. The trajectory has been the state disinvesting from base education funding, pretending like they're cutting taxes but raising yeah. school funding. Well, that, was the, budget. that yeah. was the budget the governor proposed actually put the onus on local taxpayers and school districts rather than on state revenue. That's true, and, and, and one of the things that uh, I have been harping on, and, and, and it's been bipartisan in the Senate, harping on the same thing, is that trajectory to reverse that. It's very dangerous trajectory, and, and, that, and, and uh, what this budget did this year is responsible tax relief because it helps pay down what would otherwise be more local property taxes because as you said, the governor wanted it to be majority local property right. tax and minority of the funding would have been from state funds. And that's a very dangerous thing. Well, you, as long as you brought up education, let me stay on education just for a moment. Senator, in the, the education bills that passed, there is a lot of concern that so much money has been diverted from public schools, especially in the capital, uh, capital pot, to the charter schools, not only siphoning money off of public school capital capital pots, but also there was a bill that would sort of tell the people involved no profits are supposed to go to the people building, the developers, let's, let's keep the money in the schools, but that didn't pass. So it didn't public schools really take a hit this time? Well, no, I think we, uh, we made a lot of progress in education in terms of capital funding, in terms of what we were just talking about, which is property tax relief for, for everybody, uh, local property tax relief. We have record funding for education. Now, can we do more and should we do more? Absolutely, we should do more and we can, and we can do more. I think one of the important things that, that you want to talk about is what's been done for special needs kids in our state. Yeah. And I think that was a very, very important uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, prerogative of the, of the president of the Senate. We were able to accomplish that. In terms of what you're talking about, which is the profits for the private developers of, of charter schools, you know the Senate position was a strong one against that. Um, it, yeah, it, it was it, the it, House it, that really beat that down. Yeah, if exactly. I can, uh, I'm already on record, so it's no surprise to say, I have complimented you publicly, let me do it again, for stopping the open carry and campus carry bills that were, it appeared to be on their way to perhaps passage 
in the Senate and the House. Now, why did you do that? I'm glad you did, but why did you do it? And how much pressure was there from Marianne Hammer, the NRA, and gun supporters? Well, I, I stopped campus carry last session as well. So it's two years in a row now that I've stopped campus carry. I did stop it last time the legislature met last session, and I did it this session. I also stopped open carry and airport carry, which was another one of the, yeah. of the bills that we had. And yeah, there was pressure. Um, you know, the uh, NRA put a lot of pressure. You have to remember that the open carry bill was actually um, a bill that was sponsored by Senator Don Gates, who's a right. former Senate president and a se former a Senate of, president. A lot of clout up there. A yeah. lot of clout. A lot of clout and a lot of pressure. But, you know, well, to so me... What was your, excuse me, Miko. What was your reasoning? Why didn't you think it was a good idea for open carry? A number of other states do it, but particularly campus carry, where at state college universities... Uh, kids who are 21 or over and have a concealed weapons permit could have brought guns on campus. Just not a good idea, was it? I don't think it's a good idea, and I was, I've was i been quoted as saying that it's not a good idea to give every 21-year-old with a uh, concealed carry permit uh, uh, you know, and a, and a beer keg uh, a gun, that that doesn't make our schools safer. Uh, it makes our schools less safe. And so, you know, if there's a concern and there is a concern about campus safety and what have you, there are ways to address that. But it's not by giving every 21-year-old a handgun. You know, listening to this, it strikes me there is as much news about things that did not pass as there yeah. are that did pass. And one of one of the big losers was Enterprise Florida. Oh, absolutely. The governor's yeah. big initiative to put, what, $250 million into job, job creation. Sure. But, Representative, what the governor said was without this, 227 business deals that would have created 50,000 jobs might not happen. I, is right. that ringing an alarm? Uh, no, and, and if, I can, if I can touch on the, on the gun bills just very briefly, sure. I think w one of the things we, I, I would say two things about the gun bills. One thing we have to thank again is the Fair Districts Amendments that really de dealt with gerrymandering because it has moderated the Senate quite a bit more. It's not just the gun bills that were stopped in the Senate. There Everyone's up for election. Right. Everyone. A right. And, I, and I do have to say, um, you know, wh while, uh, while the senator was consistent on uh, campus carry, uh, waffled a little bit on the, uh, the open carry and ultimately uh, took the position you did, I, I do want to call you out a little bit on, on the stand your ground law there was a, that, that the senator did vote for. It was a significant rewrite of stand your ground that would have given uh, basically, you know, we all agree that if somebody uses force or kills somebody uh, in self-defense that they should have an opportunity to prove it, but this would have made the prosecutors have to prove that, and that was dangerous. But on, on, on enterprise... Right, well, hold, hold, yeah. hold on just a minute. I want to give uh, Senator Miguel diaz a chance to respond to, to that on uh, uh, stand your ground. Well, I'll tell you, look, we, you want to talk about, you know, killing or stopping bad legislation. And I not only was one of the people who, you know, participated in stopping open carry or campus carry or airport carry, I actually led that charge as chairman of the Judiciary Committee in stopping those bad bills because they were bad public policy. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is that there's a reason why, you know, the League of Women Voters honored me as one of only three legislators this year to get uh, their uh, working democracy making democracy work uh, award right. and that's because of the positions that I've consistently taken over but, the years on, on stand your ground did you support the uh, the bill that uh, yeah, the it, representative it, uh, uh, on the issue of stand on the issue of stand your ground uh, there was uh, I did vote uh, for a slight modification in committee but ultimately that's not something that we ended up supporting and it didn't become a priority of the senate uh, as you can tell and as you've seen the senate has always you know led and i've been one of those leaders for the last five or six years in the senate to have a uh, a moderate common sense approach yeah. to well, legislation it, and common it, sense is what yeah. it's about well it's more moderate i think over in the senate the house is fairly conservative you're not but we understand that <laughs> we, we need all to right, take so a quick so we got to take a break we do we'll be right back we are back talking end of session with Senator Miguel Diaz de la Portilla and Representative Jose Javier Rodriguez. And right before the break, we started talking about one of the failures of the session, Enterprise Florida, a big, big priority for the governor. He was out there with ads. He had surrogates campaigning. And you were one of the big opponents, representative of that? Yes, absolutely. So, I, so the, the, what the governor wanted to do was we, we have hundreds of millions of dollars of public money that's invested in the private sector under the guise of economic development. Some of the programs, maybe they work, some don't. There's not very good oversight on that. The governor wanted to reduce oversight, 
and multiply by five how much the public invests in these programs. In the Senate, uh, there, there was an effort to fund that at $250 million. In the House, there was significant opposition. Uh, I worked with a group of Republicans and a small group of Democrats to, to basically block it from the Finance and Tax Committee, uh, the, the policy component of what the governor wanted. Mm -hmm. and, and ultimately, um, you know, House leadership was, uh, was effectively against it, and it, it did not get funded to that tune. I'm happy about that. I think it's unfortunate we didn't have a, a realistic conversation about what it means to do economic development. Um, but I think that uh, putting more money with less oversight into these slush funds the governor has is not the way to use the public's and, money. And, Senator, I think one of the arguments against that funding was that there are in the escrow accounts of Enterprise Florida now millions and millions of dollars that have not been paid out. Correct, about $143 million there sit, sitting there. So yeah, it's a significant, yeah. it's a significant right. amount of money. But, but, but I want to say something I, about economic development yeah, that, sure. I, that I think is important, you know, particularly for our community here in Miami-Dade County. Miami-Dade County did very, very well in this budget in terms of local projects and projects that are directly go to the heart to the small businesses and economic development in our community, including the $1 million that I got for uh, Miracle Mile, ref refurbishing of Miracle Mile, which is very, very important because there's mostly, you know, small businesses that we're right. talking about and along the, that street. And the underline, uh, beneath the metro rail, there's $2 million there. Don't know what the governor a absolutely. will do with that, but yeah. that's also a very exciting project. That's a game-changing project, and that's a project that I worked very closely on with Parker Thompson and, right. uh, and uh, his daughter, and Meg his, Daly. Yeah, she's uh, very impressive. So, so that's a terrific game-changing project, I think, and for Miami-Dade County in terms of uh, inviting economic development in our community. So those are the kind of things that, that really, really work to stimulate uh, job creation in, in, our, uh, in our community. That's a common sense approach to, uh, to uh, economic development, well, and I think that's good. I, I agree, and I, and I think that, uh, you know, again, I think it was a great year for, for us in the day delegation. Uh, the underlying, uh, you know, a lot of water projects like the Miami River cleanup, uh, Senator mentioned the you know Miracle Mile. There's a lot of uh, you know good things for us in terms of I, I hate to say bringing home the bacon, but unfortunately that that is yeah. part of our job as a day delegation sure. to make sure that we get yeah. our share, and we we we, we, t we tend not to get our share. Are yes. you able to say uh, Broward County? Uh, we regretfully didn't have a Broward lawmaker here, but did Broward County fare as well? Do you know? Not as well as Miami Day, but I think Broward County did pretty well as well. And 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 really, you had a, a session where there was a lot of harmony. I think that the uh, Senate's moderate moderating tone over the last you know uh, six years has has definitely contributed to that. I think the president of the Senate contributed greatly to that. Andy Gardner and his style of leadership uh, to empower the committee chairs to to make policy decisions to mm -hmm. just bring down the temperature yeah. of of well, the debate. It worked. It, it worked. A uh, representative. One of the I think uh, good things that came out of the this session of the legislature. Uh, is that uh, Floridians, especially here in South Florida, I know anecdotally, tremendously upset that nothing had really been done on Amendment 1, passed what, in 2012, to protect environmentally fragile uh, the Everglades and springs around the state. Uh, the money had been diverted to other uses, but you passed a bill that sets aside $250 million for 20 years to implement Amendment 1. Uh, tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so, you know, as many people know, more than 70% of the electorate voted for Amendment 1, which is dedicated to making sure primarily our water resources um, are, are protected uh, as, as a priority in, in our state funding. And th the problem was that that wasn't just violated the, uh, the last year, that was brazenly violated. I mean, I think if you look at what the money was used for, um, the, it, it, they basically to do were asking, with what the people yeah, had voted for. Asking for a lawsuit. So I worked with uh, Representative Harrell in the House, and I know this was a priority for Senator Negron, um, to uh, take some of those funds and specifically designate them to Everglades Restoration and, uh, you know, uh, and dealing with the estuaries. And a lot of people have been following what's happening a little yeah. further north of us. Right. And that bill did pass, and, and that is a very good uh, policy going forward. I think yeah. the biggest concern with that policy is that it, there was nothing in that bill that holds the actual polluters of the waters responsible. And the onus is again on the taxpayers for the cleanup. Well, yeah. listen, I was one of two legislators in the entire legislature that voted against the big water bill this year for precisely that reason. The pol and, and that it shifts over the long term cost of cleanup to the taxpayers yeah. away from polluters. But this bill doesn't deal with that. This All bill right, takes... Representative, I'm going to yeah, have to forgive Correct. me, cut you off. Don't mean to be discourteous, sure. but we are out of time. Thank you for Thank coming you. in. Thank you Thank very, you very much. Thank you very much, Senator. Great to, great, great to have you again.
again, congrats on uh, open carry and campus carry. Thank Up you. next, the debates and debacles of presidential politics ahead of the Florida primary. We take that and everything else to the roundtable. Stay with us. It is time now for some analysis and informed opinion. We think it's informed <laughs> about this week's top stories with our powerhouse roundtable. Oh, we have a good one for you today. Glad to welcome back Mark Caputo, the Florida correspondent for Politico and author of the Politico Daily Playbook, which is must reading for political junkies. And welcome back as well to Anthony Mann, lead political reporter for the Sun Sentinel. And Shall I say welcome back as well? <laughs> welcome to the roundtable, Bernadette Pardo, veteran political reporter in South Florida, op-ed columnist for El Nuevo Herald, and host of her own show on WQBA Radio. Or as I like to say, WQBA. Yes, uh, <laughs> Let's yeah. hear the trill. Radio <laughs> Mambi. Well, it doesn't matter. Anyway, <laughs> great, great to have you yes. all here this morning. And no lawyers this morning. Not that I, I love our lawyers, yeah. but this is... The, the coverage right here. Well, let's begin, if we can, and Anthony, let me t turn to you first with uh, this, uh, I think alarming is a word that fits the, the violence we have seen at the Trump campaign rallies. Uh, really disturbing because, in my view anyway, I think this infects the political system at every level. We've got it now in presidential politics. I think it's going to happen maybe in other campaigns as well anyway when you saw the the you know the the fights the violence in Chicago Friday well, what did you think it was just uh, amazing and shocking I mean the, I think the same reactions that everybody else had and uh, it was I guess not surprising that it really came to that because you can tell there's sort of the temperature has been rising and a lot of agitation among people who really like Donald Trump and among people who really don't like Donald Trump yeah. especially in Chicago. I mean, this is a city reeling from race relation discord. And to have that kind of crowd there, especially, you know, ramped up. I mean, you know, Mark, you've been covering every moment of these rallies. The, the geography counts here. Right. Well, uh, my father was a reporter at the Chicago Tribune and covered the 1968 Democratic Convention. You know, I, I'm now a reporter and I'm basically seeing a similar thing here. I mean, we don't see police cracking skulls, at least not yet. But to Anthony's point, it's, the temperature's been rising. A Democratic operative I spoke to yesterday, one of the top ones in Florida, Kevin Cates, said something interesting. You know, if these guys really cared, the protesters, he said, and he's a Democrat, if these guys really cared about making a difference and really defeating Trump, they wouldn't be doing this just to get on TV. They'd be organizing their communities, getting people to vote, and turning them out to vote. Because in the end, if people are really concerned about Donald Trump, doing this actually strengthens him in a Republican primary. It doesn't weaken him. Yeah. But Bernie, it's, Bernie, I'm not surprised. Here. And I, I brought a quote and everything because okay. I, I thought it was a brilliant article in the New Yorker by David Remnick. I read and, that, it yeah. and it says here what's happening. It's I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm going to summarize it. But basically, he says insults, bigotry, nationally televised assurances of adequate genital dimensions. This is the political moment in which we live. The Republican Party, having spent years courting the basest impulses of political culture, are now seeing the writing on the wall. And it says Donald Trump in very big letters. And the president said the same thing in South by Southwest. Right. He said, oh, and we're surprised, quoting the, you know, the, the movie Casablanca, there's, this, there's gambling and there's establishment. Just shocked at this. It's yeah, well. been going on for years, and he's just the latest and possibly most perfect Well, he also helped stoke it with, the, with Donald Trump made a name for himself in a, in a segment of the conservative movement, not the whole conservative movement, but a segment of it by pushing the birther myth that President Obama was mm -hmm. not an American. And the Republican establishment didn't really uh, try to stop that. I mean, they kind of, they said, oh, maybe, or we're not really sure, and they didn't want to alienate the people that believed that when all that yeah. birther stuff well, was Well, how going culpable, uh, Bernie, I mean, you've been in the news business, we both have decades. How culpable are we by sort of being enablers of Donald Trump? I mean, it is undeniable when he has a news conference. Uh, if you turn to Fox or CNN or MSNBC, 
if it's an hour, they will put all of that hour on the air. And then, of course, well, Channel when, 10 when, and local stations. During the primary yeah. night on Tuesday when Hillary had won, he was there selling steaks and no one would break away. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Well, you know, but, twice in the last week I've heard both Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz say it's the media's fault. Of course they're going to do that. That's their, their save get, their, their common response but, to anything. But is it? Well, to a degree it is in that I, I don't mind the press or TV especially broadcasting all these speeches. What I mind is is not the vetting of what he actually says afterward. Yesterday, Donald Trump says on Twitter that there's been dishonest, word is there's been dishonest early voting in Florida, and we, he said, are going to be uh, asking law enforcement to investigate. So. Unlike a lot of other reporters, I actually called the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, I called the Division of Elections, and I emailed each, six, each of the 67 county supervisors. And no one knew what he was talking about. So, if but, you but the news is out there, to your point. The well, news yeah, is out but there. But as long as you vet the candidate, th that's important. Yeah. But if the candidate's creating news, it's our job to cover it. Uh, but the candidates themselves, with the exception of Jeb Bush, they, they all enabled him, I think. You they know. did. I think, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but... Uh, Rick Wilson, a Tallahassee consultant, said it best that the strategy of the candidates, especially Ted Cruz, was playing with the alligator in the hopes that it eats you last. <laughs> <laughs> and good, that is what's yeah. happening. Yeah, you know, I they should, there are also a lot ahead, of voters honey. who there are a lot of voters who are voting for Donald Trump. So I mean, to blame the media may be also a little bit misplaced. Well, it's Very easy misplaced. too. I mean, we are a big target, and we are self-satisfied and smug and egotisticals, and we deserve a lot of criticism. But enough about but me. <laughs> 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 All right. You know, I thought that one of the best moments in the presidential debates, the Democratic debate, was when Jorge Ramos just, or actually Karen Tumulty of the Washington Post, said to Hillary, uh, is Donald Trump a racist? I mean, boy, that's putting it out there pretty bluntly. And, uh, uh, Mark, it seems to me that she sort of did a soft shoe for about 30 seconds and then enumerated all the reasons why he is but wouldn't use the word racist. I, I maybe, maybe it's not popular for me to say it, is I think he has abetted racial bigotry or bigotry, but I, I, I don't see any direct proof that Donald Trump is a racist, but he is benefiting from some very racist most people. Most people who, who respond to this, and most people who are racist don't think they're racist. <laughs> they honestly don't. They think, you know, right. they're, they're aggrieved. So, so if they I have said a, most of my friends are, I have many good Cuban friends, that kind of a thing, that or I have many black thing. friends. You know, they or call that microaggressions. Yeah. Quick, All right. Yeah, quick break. Yeah. Hold Would on. Would you like to go? We're going to take a break. We'll be back with our roundtable. Just stick with us. And welcome back on the Sunday morning, live in our studio. The roundtable is rocking and rolling <laughs> with Anthony Mann of the Sun Sentinel, Bernadette Pardo of El Nuevo Herald, and WQBA Mark Caputo of Politico. Mark, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Marco Rubio. We just saw the interview that I recorded with him this morning. Uh, he says that he's going to win Florida, despite the polls saying he's down by between 9 to 22 points. Uh, and then he says, I'll go on even if I lose. How does he do that? Uh, well, he, he does it by himself, probably. Campaigns are like vehicles. Vehicles take gas. Campaign money is the gas for your vehicle. If you, if you are tarred as a loser, can't win your own state, contributors aren't going to give you your money, your car's not going to run anymore. Right. And he has to say that. The things that he's been saying in your interview and in recent days, I mean, he can't, he can't be anything other it's than publicly painful, optimistic. It's painful to watch because I think, honestly, truly, the Ides of March are upon us and yeah. it's going to be bloody. And it's math. I just honestly don't see yeah. at this point how it's he It's not much different from what Jeb Bush was saying near the end of his campaign. You never saw inklings of anything more than I'm going to continue forward. We're plodding along. But, and the math then was not the math now. Bernie, uh, 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 wouldn't you agree that Marco Rubio, until about 11 or 12 days ago, was just riding high? He was ascendant. He until, was going up. Until until the lethal debate. Yeah, the, the Houston. The, the lethal debate started the downfall. The yeah. state, it was a concatenation of things, losses. People, even in my audience, who was very pro Rubio. I've noticed uh, lately a lot of people are saying they're voting for Ted Cruz, really? although I, there are a lot of them who support uh, Donald Trump. Well, this, this was, to say the obvious, when Marco began talking about uh, uh, Trump's spray tan, how he and urinated hands, on please. himself, and then small hands and the other stuff. 
Uh, I mean, that was just a colossal yeah. error of judgment. It was symptomatic of a problem. It wasn't the cause of his problem. He was already well on his way to losing. I think what Bernie was referring to was the New Hampshire debate, yeah. where he really fell on his face. Yeah. Marco yeah. Rubio's yeah, campaign, Chris Christie. Chris Christie. right? Marco yeah. Rubio's campaign was always on a tightrope. He had zero margin for error, and he slipped there. And when you slip on a tightrope, the results are not pretty. Did you? It's so interesting to listen to him now taking the high road and looking very cerebral and admonishing the tone and the the violent tactics of the Trump campaign. But but when he got down in the Trump territory, with the hands and the size matters. That you saw his numbers really go down after that. that well, was actually, surprising to a lot of his you supporters. Saw, right, but don't mistake correlation with causation. Uh, if you look at the exit polls in Virginia, that w the Virginia vote was right after Rubio did all the hand stuff, and he, the last three day decider showed that he won forty percent of that vote. So there's no evidence that it cost him was a vote. Was it Trump no, that's votes that he got? That's a good question. They're probably yeah. late breaking and undecided. What we do know is that winning begets winning. And yeah. especially in this campaign, when he lost those other states, you know, in Virginia he yeah, didn't that's win. That's why he was downhill from that debate and on, again, I, I think that, I think the crude language from Rubio, so to speak, was symptomatic of a problem, not the cause of problem. He needed attention, and he started going, yeah. you know. Yeah. Something that's so interesting Twilight. is looking at uh, Thursday night's debate, he and how different he was. He was more back to the Rubio that we yeah. used to see years oh, yes. ago. Yeah. He was more well, relaxed. Trump, Trump was more optimistic. presidential too. Yeah. But but Rubio really was different. I mean, he was more relaxed and um, and funny. And I thought uh, he had a very had a good very night. good night. Uh, uh, Bernie, let's look for a second at the Democrats. Um, uh, Bernie Sanders has sort of served notice in Michigan on Tuesday and on subsequently that he's in this for the next couple of months. I mean, this is going to go on. The inevitable Hillary Clinton is not quite as inevitable. But it was an interesting debate because he brought up a whole bunch of uh, uh, details about uh, immigration, what you, would you support, not right. support, the whole Minuteman issue with him. Sending children back, yeah. They're sending the children back. And uh, in Cuba, he was very much not in the wrong place at the wrong time yeah. because this is not a place in which to preach. The right. wonderfulness of, uh, of the Castro Fidel regime. Castro. How, 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 they, tough, how tough can it be to disavow Fidel Castro? Oh, that should be a layup. Yeah. You, even if you're an extreme liberal, yeah. and if you don't believe in terrible government, then you should oppose Fidel Castro. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. why didn't he say, all He's right, I said that in 1985, yeah. and I was more enamored of it. I subsequently have learned that he's done some awful things that he's, you know, repressive, totalitarian uh, government. I mean, wh how hard is that? And and by 85, his record was pretty clear <laughs> what Fidel Castro yeah, yeah, did. Yeah, yeah, I just, yeah, I don't yeah, get exactly. it. Exactly. Sorry, so, Trump called him a communist. Yeah, right. Okay. So, Bernie, let me ask you, what are your listeners and what are you hearing about the president's trip to uh, Cuba next week? Next My week. listeners are not very happy with it, although some call and say that, you know, the same thing about 50 years of doing the same thing and not working. Uh, they, they wanted to dictate the terms of the visit, which is difficult, yeah. and to a degree they did because he, Obama insists he's going to meet with his dissidents, not their dissidents. Right. I was there with Ben Rhodes, was, excuse mm -hmm. me, Ben Rhodes, the Deputy National Security Advisor, was in town on Friday. I was there when he had a couple of meetings. But the point is not that. Everybody knows that. I mean, these people get beat up publicly every week, so yep. it's not every a secret. Sunday. But what is interesting to me is here they're trying to sell a capitalism in a country that doesn't believe in private property. It's a very difficult proposition. They've already approved like 400 permits for corporations to right. go down there and invest. Yeah, and now but Marriott it, and Starwood and AT&T and Carnival Cruise Line. But your first I mean, question is, who do you pay, your employee or the government? It's a very it's different system. It's the military. Got to make yeah. a deal with the government. The military. All right, well, wish we had more time. We do not. Thank you all for coming in. As always, we'll thank you. See you thank again you. soon. And uh, don't you go away, though, because still to come, my personal perspective about this violence that's been breaking out at the Trump campaign rallies. He says he's not responsible. I think he is. Take a live look now from our Miami Tower Cam. Clouds are building. Rain is coming. Here is Weather Authority meteorologist Jennifer Correo with the rest of the forecast.
Good afternoon, South Florida. Happy Sunday. Still seeing plenty of sunshine. If you want to go to the beach, why not? It's beautiful out there. There's still high rip current risk, and we can expect a few showers already developing on the inland areas uh, with that daytime heating. Also, we don't have high pressure over us anymore. These will mainly impact Broward County and northward for this afternoon. Otherwise, it's a mix of sun and clouds, more humid with a high of 83 degrees, a surf two to three feet, and next week will be warming up to the mid 80s. Drying out Tuesday. Jennifer, thanks. All right, before we leave you this morning, a personal perspective about this disturbing outbreak of violence at Donald Trump's campaign rallies. He says he is not responsible for it, but in every way he is. The Trump supporter who sucker punched a black protester as he was being led out of a rally in North Carolina says that protester deserved it, and next time maybe they'll have to kill him. I wish I could say that was an isolated incident, but really it is not. On Friday night in Chicago, pro and anti-Trump forces clashed at a rally, and it had to be canceled out of security concerns, and they were justified. Donald Trump says he isn't responsible for this violence or any violence, but just listen to what he has said at rallies in recent weeks. I'd like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. Knock the crap out of him, would you? Seriously. You know what they used to do to guys like that when they were in a place like this? They'd be carried out on a stretcher. That kind of overheated rhetoric would be unacceptable from anyone in a public setting, but from a candidate for president, it is reprehensible, anti-democratic, just wrong. And yet Trump continues to deny any responsibility. Abraham Lincoln, who Republicans like to say epitomizes their party, once said he wanted to appeal to the better angels of our nature, and he did. So have all our greatest political leaders. Uh, they have appealed to our best and noblest instincts. Donald Trump does not. He has started a fire he may not be able to put out, but he must quickly and unequivocally disavow this violence or it's going to infect our political system and stain this election season. That's my perspective for this week. We'd love to hear yours. Remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. Have a beautiful Sunday. We'll see you next week.